My name is Eric Goldberg. I'm a partner of the law firm, Moshe from Morosky, LLP. We are a 90 person law firm in Midtown Manhattan. And I'm the coach of the real estate department. Moshe may be considered as a mid sized firm, but by New York standards, but we do big New York deals and big deals around the country. The title of panel's topic today is the Outlook for Residential. For more than 20 years, I've represented clients in residential deals from the Lower East Side of Manhattan, including the purchase and sale of 250 East Thousand Street, which was known for the statue of Lenin atop the building, to the upscale of Upper East Side and Trinity West End Avenue. In addition to multifamily transactions, I've been involved in many projects involving office buildings and hotels, from the office building on Lexington 53rd, known as the City Port Center, to 9th Avenue North in Seattle, Washington, where I, over the past three years I've worked on acquiring buildings for the value of over one and a half billion dollars. I regularly brainstorm with my clients with strategic decisions making in the residential space, helping to structure proposals, offers, and close deals, or exit deals with little or no damage. We're not on the phone negotiating deals or strafting documents. I write cutting horses and competitions in the Northeast. These horses can be more challenging than opposing lawyers. Our focus today is on the outlook for residential and now turn to the panel for their own introductions. Sure. Thanks, Eric. My name is Dane Klein. I'm the uh, Chief Investment Officer and one of the founders of One Wall Partners. Uh, we are a vertically integrated uh, real estate owner operator of exclusively multi family property. Specifically, workforce housing within the Northeast. Um, so, we uh, focus on the trends oriented, lifestyle oriented, uh, usually suburban communities, kind of on the outskirts of cities, and major employment centers here in the Northeast. Uh, my name is Brian O'Neill. I'm one of the principals at Alcatar Holdings. Uh, we are a Philadelphia based uh, multi family, long term builder, <coughs> workforce housing as well. Uh, I know workforce housing is a term that's getting thrown around a lot, so just to you guys have idea what we do, you know, our average tenant income is 35, so it's about a dollars a year, and we're primarily in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Greg Gleason, MC Real Estate Corporation, current owner, operator, developer, and direct lender. Um, New York based, so the last few years we've been reacting on our markets in the uh, north, east, south, east, and west coast. Um, Jay Yoon, uh, CIO of New York Life Investment Management. A third party uh, uh, investment arm of the insurance company New York Life. And sounds like the furthest removed from actual real estate activities personally. Okay, great. Jay, uh, let's start with you. Um, what is the view of residential real estate by New York Life for its investment product? Yeah, so um, in this case, we're presenting our, our viewpoint of our general account. Assets that uh, are uh, invested in real estate. Obviously, your life uh, as a firm is about 600 plus billion, of which the general account is about 250, of which real estate investment cost basically comes about 55 billion. And I think for, for the last few years, our real estate team has had, maybe for a little longer than they would like to admit, been fairly. Um, um, Find the actual equity core properties, particularly the gateways, is expensive. But they enjoy multifamily uh, activities, lending to it and owning it, equity and debt in, in, in some of the gateways is in the earlier part of the, the expansion. In the last three, four years, we've actually increased our allocation to real estate um, across different um, yeah, equity and debt. Uh, in this late cycle, over for longer, need to chase yields like everyone else. But we've been moving towards where the demographic trends are friendlier, which is the next year city. So it used to be, you know, the next year city used to be the Denver, you know, even Seattle, etc. Now we're moving in Vernon way uh, to, to other pockets, um, maybe southwest, southeast, um, away from, I guess, the north. There's migration, obviously, of, of, of due to technology uh, uh, being the theme. I think there's a lot of migration, and all of you know where they, they are. What we do is we also moved away from core to like so-called value-added or core plus, 
we typically go after B rate conversion type of uh, multifamily homes in these areas. Uh, we obviously don't get involved in single family uh, type of thing, uh, homes. Um, and I think that trend uh, we like. Today, uh, you know, we, we actually had a big meeting today about investments across the domestic classes, and like, you can't generalize anymore. Everything's expensive. You know, within real estate, beyond real estate, um, you know, there obviously the thing, we, we all know to stay away from certain things as we tell because it, it's decaying at a, a, a slow pace, but we know that the disruption is going, going on, logistics may be better to focus on, and it's all about conversion to tech, right? Whether it's healthcare tech or everything's turning into some sort of software tech uh, transformation, and we need to, uh, we want to participate in that. Okay, thank you, Greg. How do you adopt your investment approach to changes in the market cycle? Uh, so, you know, we have some actors to play with between you know, debt, um, or core type of play, this development, uh, and planning for market. So we, we tend to stay in residential, but we multi have student housing and uh, luxury condo. Um, recently, in the last three, four years, we've seen a near pricing at the point where we're not comfortable and side, we've been active on the lending side, um, and then finding the markets, and to Jay's point, a little bit in front of the capital curve, um, you know, the southeast we've got really attractive um, uh, for the ground and development. Um, you know, the west coast is more of a specialized student housing play with, uh, with the Berkeley University out there. Um, so, you know, moving in and out of the capital stack, and then playing markets where they, where they have the streets. Um, but yeah, recently we started to see upticks even in some of those more remote markets and construction costs. So, you know, you can only avoid the pressure for so long until you have to stay there. Thank you. <clears throat> Brian, I know LX are holding focusing on affordable housing, and your company is based in Philadelphia. Are you looking to other markets outside of your home base? And if so, how do you talk with those opportunities? Uh, sure. So, you know, our primary target is, you know, we, when you talk about second tier, third tier, you know, we're maybe a hundred tier. Um, and we're, we're in areas like Darlene, Pennsylvania, Norristown, uh, those of you who know Philly. Uh, we focus on really the Rust Belt town strategy. I mean, we look for towns that the perception is that they've kind of fallen from grace, but the reality is they still have really good infrastructure, good transportation into major urban centers like Philadelphia. And they have grown populations. Um, you know, every town we go into, the population is growing about 1% a year, uh, with people making the demographic that we're targeting, the 35 to $55,000 a year. Um, we haven't had to leave our markets yet, uh, you know, between Pennsylvania and South Jersey, but I'm sure you know, any type of town that would, would fit that mold in those demographic growths is somewhere where, you know, we'd be quite attractive, uh, both on the acquisition side and as well. Nate, I don't want to be a precursor of bad terms, but you asked, uh, now I'm asking you, how does your investment strategy mitigate the risk of recession? Sure, yeah, so uh, for a lot of different means, um, really, uh, so we talked a little bit about workforce housing, and, and we have, you know, we kind of define it as the median income between 60 and 120%. Um, and so we're really targeting that middle class, but, but in the areas that we're in, the markets that we're in, um, we also look a lot at what is the employment center, what is the employment base of those locations. And so we're in Northern New Jersey, we're in the Philadelphia area, we're in Eastern Pennsylvania, we're in you know, state capitals like Harrisburg and Albany. We're in places where there's a lot of education, medicine, and government workforce. Those folks fit well within you know, the income bands that can afford our apartments, and they also aren't the people that are getting laid off in the sessions. You still need your nurses, your police officers, uh, and so on. And so that's, that's kind of phase one of of being cushioned in a recession. And then just by virtue of being in that kind of class B uh, type, you know, rent of $1,000 a month, $1,200 a month, $1,400 a month, um, anytime you see a trade down scenario where, let's say you go from a two income household and one of the uh, people gets laid off in, in a recession, they oftentimes make a decision about how to save money on housing costs and then they would come down into a lower price uh, apartment from maybe a single family home or from a higher price, you know, class A apartment, maybe out of the center of the city, a little bit out, out to the outskirts where we are, um, but, but try to get um, still 
good living situation that's accessible to them where their jobs are. And, uh, uh, and then thirdly, uh, we have structured a fund, um, which is specifically a pure play opportunity to be in the preferred equity layer of the transactions that we're investing in as a sponsor. Um, so what that does is it creates a whole, um, uh, creates a last dollar uh, limit on where your basis is in that investment, right? So if your preferred is at call it 85% of cost in the asset, um, then the value of that asset can decline by 15% without you losing a dollar in principal. Um, meanwhile, these are cash flowing assets and they're already stable, highly occupied in urban, densely populated areas that can't have competition. So uh, Greg mentioned the construction costs and some of these outlying markets that we're going to. You know, for us, we're being, being able to buy things at a low basis, well below replacement cost. If you're in the preferred fund, you're another 15% below that basis. Um, and so on a current basis, the cash flow can fall, the occupants can drop, the asset can depreciate, and you can still get the full return. Okay, thank you. Hmm, Jay, for another approach in 2020, what is your biggest concern for residential real estate? Yeah, so um, <laughs> you play in so called you know, the positive demographic, demographic and uh, cities, uh, urbanization, obviously, you know, everybody is not sure of the mark. We like to play the UA commercial properties as, as uh, some of these jobs are actually you know, high in uh, for white collar jobs. And there is clearly a supply of many balance in some of these uh, up and coming cities. We particularly like the UA. Property because I think you go too far down, there is a risk of rent control. And I think as you go lower, you can see that's where you know, uh, all the issues with populism and, and, and income inequality would like to overlay their, their support for those that are maybe less uh, well to you. So, uh, whereas in super luxury, also, then you have the super quality and you know, so called late cycle that a lot of people believe were mid cycle. Whether we're mid cycle or late cycle, where evaluations are behaving uh, late cycle, and there's little room for error. So I, 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 I think rent control is an issue, and obviously also the time demand. There's clearly quite a bit of supply coming online, and, and real estate is kind of a very busy, busy market. And so we're starting to see supply starting to see demand. Right? We've actually had uh, need for multifamily, family, and now we've actually started to see the need balance for the <clears throat> One of the things on the rent control, uh, you know, in Pennsylvania, we're obviously we're not a rent control state. Uh, you know, we have a JV equity fund, and we're constantly meeting with investors, and we get that question all the time. You know, what are our thoughts on rent control? How would that affect the business? And you know, for us, you know, we play the market. I'm sure they would agree. You know, everything is in the buy. You know, you have to acquire. You know, we get our loan replacement costs. We have very high loan yields. We're north of nine. You know, we're a kind of say cash flow based firm. And, you know, because that is where our money is made. And if you look at these rent control laws, you know, Oregon is one that we looked at, California, obviously New York. You know, Oregon allows you to get 7% rent increases a year. You know, for us, if we were getting 7% a year on our tenant base, you know, our average rent's 800 bucks, 750. I mean, that would be, that would be unbelievable for us. I mean, it's just not reality. It doesn't happen in our market, you know, because. You know, the way we look at our tenants is a $25 swing one way or the other, you know, it's a big deal for them. And so we know, you know, for us, we make most of our money, as I'm sure you do, is keeping turnover almost to non existent. You know, our debt, debt is about 2%, and our turnover, you know, our average tenant lasts more than six years. So for us, the priority in our market is getting a good tenant and keeping them versus the model of, okay, you get my 3%, 5%, 9% increase a year. Um, so I think it's, it's interesting to see down this area where we play and you know, rent control, I think it becomes less of an issue. Just because the business model isn't, isn't built on essentially those, those large rent increases. Are, are you guys seeing competition sort of percolate down from uh, value-added guys? I mean, we're seeing a ton of competition in that space and broader interpretation of what value-added is. Um, is that percolating them where you're starting to have to buy over assets or Price and pressure starting to enter, so it is, but we so we actually we buy small assets. So we don't buy anything that's above ten units in a building. And you know, we noticed once you get above you know in that fifteen unit building, 
I don't care if it's a 15 unit building or a 5 unit building in North South Pennsylvania. To me, the underwriting is the same. So, uh, you know, we're always out bid for those larger buildings. But finally, we say, you know what, we're not going to pay that. Let's just buy just plenty of smaller buildings that we can buy in our markets. And that's kind of how we avoid that pricing pressure. Um, just because it's, it's, it's hard. Uh, it's, it's a lot more boring, I guess, to do the smaller type, type asset. But that's how we avoid it. Greg, what are you seeing as the biggest investment challenges for your company in 2020? Um, yeah, I would say generally that there's, there's a lot of crowded trades. You know, that, that um, you know, value add on the development side, you're seeing a lot of pressure on um, on costs. Not, and it's becoming less local. That you still would you know, sort of differentiate where you get low construction costs in a certain, certain market. But now that's going, you know, there's, there's more regional sort of cost consolidation and thinking in part to sort of find those, those, those opportunities on the construction side. Um, as I mentioned, value added things has been a crowded place to play. Um, so, you know, there's just a lot of crowded trades where capital are chasing deals and making harder, harder to find opportunistic that returns. Uh, a lot of people have been talking about the challenges in New York. We've been out of the thinking that we're New York guys. We've been Sellers the last three, four years. Um, so we're actually not really have a you know, high conviction thesis yet, but, but we actually see you know, good opportunities to potentially develop out of this you know, distressed dislocation. Um, so we, you know, I think we've managed our book to a point where we're hopeful that we're going to take advantage of that, but um, the issues are real. So. Okay, Nate. What rules website says the government utilizes an quote a thematic macro approach to first assess markets and then identify specific deal opportunities? Close quote. Can you give us a little insight on how you identify markets with opportunities? Specifically, why do you focus on the Northeast, especially in the context of the New York City uh, recent reg reg regulations? Sure. So when we we started developing our strategy right around 2012, um, 2013 timeframe, and you know, very early on, we saw how the affordability issues in New York City specifically were coming to a head. We didn't know when, but it, to me, I wasn't surprised at all or shocked at all about the rent control laws that came out and changes that occurred. We sort of had forecasted that you know six years ago as something that was likely to happen. Uh, so the first, you know, the first thing we saw was where, where do people go next as they try to get within a reasonable commuting distance of their job, but also find a reasonable rent in a place that they feel like they want to live. Um, and so New Jersey had, you know, fantastic infrastructure from the New Jersey, New Jersey transit trains, for example, and buses and other other ways to get into the city. And that dynamic plays out in other cities. And so what we've looked for thematically is. Where is there going to be an affordability crunch? Where can we supply housing that there's no competition for? Because um, if I buy the asset for $100 square foot or $125 square foot, then we can build it, replace it, and offer the same product at the same price. Um, and, uh, and so we should be in a position where that is always in demand, and the demand for that exceeds the supply. Um, and Looking at that at the micro level on a market by market basis, we identify those markets and then we look at the stability of the job climates and the population growth. Again, we're in the middle of, we're going to have a new census next year, so the last census data that people are looking at is in 2010 and some of the intermediate census data. And in a lot of these smaller markets, there's not good information about what's actually happening on the ground. And it says, oh, people are moving out of the Northeast, they're all going to Florida, they're all going to Nashville, they're all going wherever. Um, not true. There are people going there, but most of them are not workers, and most of them are not renting apartments for twelve hundred dollars a month in New Jersey. Uh, so, most Amen. Of, yeah. Amen. <laughs> so you know, most of them are, are retired. They're they're going somewhere else, or they're graduating from college and they're moving to go to their first job. But in New Jersey, there's a million millennials living at home with their parents right now, and we produce about thirty thousand new apartments a year in New Jersey. Um, so I'm not sure where those people are going to live um, when they eventually move out. And so we just see this permanent supply demand and imbalance for the product that we're offering. And then we find the markets where that issue is most important. And to us, that's the Northeast. You know, if I go to Texas, I go to Iowa, I go to other places, you can build anywhere you want at, you know, very low cost and find yourself in competition or the big, you know, major, you know, employer of that city moves out and all of a sudden there's no demand anymore for your product and no rent growth. Whereas 
We're in places people have been living for hundreds of years, so there's nowhere to build a new product that's competitive with the existing assets. Do you think millennials will leave their parents' basement, so called, to move to a multifamily in suburbia? Absolutely. They are. Yes. They are. Uh, and they, um, they're working there already, right? So they've got to move out on their own at some point. And all of these suburban locations that have train access are building up, you know, walkable downtowns that are attractive from a lifestyle perspective to these folks. Um, and for the ones that are already in the suburban environment, um, they don't need to, they can't afford, number one, they can't afford to, to move out. That's why they're living where they are. And their first, their first home is not going to be a $600,000 house in their, name, in their parents' neighborhood. So they've got to go somewhere. It's interesting too, is it's, you're, I mean, you're, I feel like you're carrying it on your own. So, <laughs> but, you know, there's a small narrative out there that the Northeast is this dying off region, you know, that the, the future is in Texas, it's in Florida, it's in the Southwest. And that's true to a certain subset of demographics. You know, we have a very large portfolio in Cumberland County, New Jersey, and I'm sure a lot of people here don't even know where Cumberland County is. So if you look at Cumberland County, Population growth. I mean, it's well over one percent a year. And just to put that in perspective, you know, if towns are growing at two percent, three percent a census every like ten years. That's strong population growth. And you know, these people are moving here for a reason. They're not moving there for the weather. Um, you know, they're moving there because they need a formal place to live. It has access to job bases where they work. Um, you know, the kind of jobs that they're holding. And it's you know, the numbers just don't tell the, the narrative. We live in this dying off region um, that isn't, you know, doesn't have growth, doesn't have uh, real estate opportunity. It's interesting you say that. So, right, Pfizer, Google, Facebook, JP Morgan, Amazon just leased it in 50,000 square feet in Western Yards. Amazon put a million and a half feet in Western Yards, a hundred million and a half square feet in Western Yards. So, so people are coming here for high paying jobs. And you mentioned earlier that you're waiting for the 2020 census. Amazon and Facebook take a census every minute. They know what's happening in the marketplace and they're coming to New York. So you say you, know, you don't think that the Northeast is dying. I have to agree with you. I think many people here will agree with you. And obviously the tech industry agrees with you. Um, yeah. These are people who know much more than you and I do. Jay, let me ask you, where is money coming from um, internationally? Um, for a while, it's coming from China. Where do you see, where is it coming now from your life, or and where do you see your gentleman coming from? Okay, so, um, I don't know the reference to China, Chinese investors, but uh, I do, um, I'm, in, I'm in the old finance industry, and I do agree with you that that uh, is attracting a lot of the stuff from uh, in, uh, uh, investors and actually, like, there's going to be a big push by Silicon Valley to get into fintech or technology, uh, finance industry with technology tools, and they're coming to New York, right? And they're going to be the new tenants of the premier uh, properties, and the old uh, economy finance people that I belong to are migrating to these other cities, and that China's already obviously started. Um, I don't actually know about uh, if your reference to China, China uh, where's the money come, coming from, but given the US for various reasons beyond yeah, real estate is where returns can be achieved with reason, um, there's money from everywhere around the world that's coming here, right? So, you know, we have, we have this view that we're going to probably stay here lower for longer in preference to interest rates. Um, despite that we are struggling with 2% uh, annual treasury rate, uh, at these levels and longer, which bodes well for real estate and, 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 and just generally core real estate, um, if, if, if nothing else other than value added in other ways to enhance returns. This is the only place, I think, in the developed world where you can actually achieve a reasonable return. Um, the problem is, is that going to be enough? Are we going to be satisfied with you know, 2019 being a great year for across all asset classes? If you look at 2020, you're going to have to uh, manage your expectation, right? So uh, unless we have this mania that fuels itself to even bigger so-called uh, valuation levels that are further stretched, 
I think we need to expect next year to be a modest return, but still uh, a better return than I think we can achieve elsewhere. Uh, with one caveat, it's all about the currency. I think the dollar, where it goes, will dictate if that trend continues or slows down. I think for a long while, the US dollar has been the winner. But uh, a lot of people project next year maybe the dollar will win. Then if that happens, will the money still flow this way? If that's the part that I'm not clear about. Thank you. Greg, I read that Oregon is heavily invested in student housing in New York City. Are you talking to other communities with universities? And if so, what do you look for in your decision making? Yeah, our, our student housing model is uh, fairly specific. So yeah, so we have a uh, student housing portfolio in the city that we have uh, naturally lease at NYU, so we have a credit tenancy. Um, so that's been hard to replicate with land prices, what they are in the city. Uh, so we kind of went to the other side of the country and replicated a similar model in, in, in Berkeley. So we just delivered a project out there, um, most of which were leasing to the university. The rest were uh, leasing out as high density. <coughs> student demand. Um, but it's kind of really needle and case that play. We haven't gone after you know the, the lower barrier tenure markets. Um, it's, it's really just kind of a specialized uh, play, uh, which has been great. It just you know, can't as easily replicate as again in some of the other markets. Okay, thank you. We just have a couple of minutes left. Uh, I'll propose this to Brian and then ask anybody else in the panel to also uh, answer the question after Brian. So Brian, New York City recently adopted very stringent rent stabilization guidelines, which in my view and others means that one million people won the lottery at the expense of seven million other people. Your company focuses on creating affordable housing. If you were advising New York City lawmakers, what would you suggest to them to help expand the number of affordable housing units in New York City? Well, I can tell you about Pennsylvania. Um, only because, you know, I'm not familiar with with New York zoning law. Um, I'm just not, I, I, I wouldn't even know what I'm talking about if I tried to find that. But, you know, I, I will tell you, you know, in our markets, you know, all of our housing is not <clears throat> government run. I mean, we, it's all private market housing. And, you know, in Pennsylvania, we, you know, you need a permit to buy and sell property, uh, especially rental property. It's all in East Rockland City. And you go through this you know, inspection process, and you know, these towns, you know, really try to hammer you at the point of sale, and it's a very heavy regulatory burden, and a lot of towns, you know, use that to restrict the supply of rental housing, um, because a lot of towns feel that, you know, their, their town is the way it is because it's 70% renters, and they want more home ownership. Um, and because of that, you know, a lot of people, you know, when you're buying a building for $20,000 a unit, it, it just may not be worth it. Go through the regulatory hurdles, and at the end of the day, it comes down to a supply issue. Because if you're taking more and more affordable supply out of the market, you know people have to go somewhere, and you can't build it. You know, I mean, when Nate was talking about the replacement costs, everything we buy, you know, our average all-in cost per unit is sixty-five thousand dollars, including our renovation. And we renovate granite countertops, full appliances, washer dryer, um, and I just don't know how you build that. I mean, there's got to be a way to improve the um, manufacturing process for the product that we sell, which is housing. Um, it's interesting, if you go on record control, I think you can't get economists to agree on anything, but I think that's the one thing that all economists agree is it doesn't work. <laughs> so, you know, that's, I guess that's my two cents on that one. So. Yeah, you know, it's funny you say that the million people want a lottery because, uh, um, you know, actually a lot of people thought they had a lottery ticket with buy up that suddenly vanished. So people thought they had a, you know, their retirement lined up. Tenants all, all of a sudden lost their water ticket, um, ironically, from that perspective. Um, but I mean, one thing New York has um, is it's very economical to build if you put relief on real estate taxes and on zoning. So, you know, in some markets it's not feasible to build up because cost, it's cost prohibitive relative to the rents being generated, et cetera. But, but here we've got lots of air and it's financially viable to build. So leveraging the private sector to take advantage of that. Um, Fourth one on the main program, you know, finished for a little while with no construction, now it's come back and now you see some construction. That, you know, it's the most efficient way to get there. Um, and again, the city has land throughout the city that it could, it could 
weapons to the private sector to, to monetize and also deliver affordable housing um, much more efficiently than you know, direct 